not only there for us, but here with us. Lord, I thank you for your provision and your, your plan. I thank you, Lord, that you are here with your promise to never leave nor forsake us. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would have free reign in our hearts, our minds, and the very essence of who we are, that we might be ever, forever changed and brought closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Go ahead and take a Bible, if you would, and turn to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk's one of those books that's uh, interesting in, in just the process of finding it. It's a very small book. <coughs> if I were to ask you, as you're finding that little book, Habakkuk, if I were to ask you, in the Bible, if you could pick a book that stands out in our day and time, most people would pick the book of Revelation. We see a lot of things going on that, that point toward end times, point toward events that are ushering in what, what looks like the end times. Um, but I would pick Habakkuk. Habakkuk is really a, a, a unique book. It's a, a, an interesting book. It's a book that took place uh, in, a, in the late 7th century B.C., and it takes place in, in, a, in a time that's very unique. It's one of only three uh, prophets. You know, most prophets, uh, they brought a message, and that message was directed at the, the people they were leading and, and the people they were with, and that message was to spur those people on and get closer to God. Good message, good way, good plan. Um, this is different because um, Nahum, who was uh, prophesied against Assyria, Habakkuk, who prophesied against Babylon, and Obadiah, who prophesied against Edom, were the only three prophets who said, not, not just about this people, but about those. There, there's, a, there's a rationale that those people are going to be held accountable to God. Now, here's the tricky part. You're going to have to help me with this. Uh, take notes on that and try to figure out where we stand. But um, which, which side are we on? Are we them people or those people? See, I always wonder when people tell me, you know, well, they said, well, who's they? Well, they can't come up with who they are. We're going to find out a little bit who they are. And I believe if you could talk to Habakkuk today, and if you will parallel some of the things that happened in his day and our day, you might see a great distinction, a great par parallel. It, it might be confusing to try to figure out which one's which, believe it or not. Um, I read a story about a, a, you know, perplexing times and things going on and I didn't realize that today is the, uh, the day that in 1919 the Treaty of Versailles was signed. The end of World War I was coming. Uh, they had uh, cornered Germany and Germany signed this Treaty of Versailles. And that may seem kind of dull and if, if I were y'all's age, you know, somebody was telling me this, I'd be like, I don't care anything about that. Um, but it was interesting because the, the time that they, they signed that, Germany was not on board. But you, Wayne, you just said they signed it. Yeah, they signed it. And they adhered to it for a while. But they didn't like it. And you know what you had? You had this really weird phenomenon. And I, I guess being of German heritage, and I can kind of talk about my people, us. You know, it's the us and them. Remember, we're still on that. I'm going to talk about us for just a minute. It got under the skin of the Germans because they didn't like it. They didn't like being told what they could do when they could do it. They didn't like somebody orchestrating and, and divvying up their country. They didn't like people who were in control and oppressing them in ways that they thought were unnatural and unnecessary. So what they did was give that over to God, right? Let that, let that be freed from them, right? No, they let it fester. <laughs> And over time, there was a, a, a dictator who, who came into power, a chancellor who came into power later, who got and capitalized on that and used that to not only start the Second World War, but to create not only genocidal events inside of Germany, but to try to conquer the world. Well, Wayne, why are you saying that? You know, because it's interesting. We are living in a day and time where I believe things are progressing so fast, it's hard to keep up. Hard to keep up with just the, the, the events that take place. And, and i got to admit, there's some things taking place that I don't really understand and I don't get and, uh, you know, why people are responding the way they do. But I do know this. When we oppress things in our spirit, they will return. And when they return, they will not be palatable. Now, you're like, well, Wayne, what are you talking about? I believe that we have repressed things in our nation for years. 
The events of today didn't start today. They started 40, 50, 60 years ago. And as they started, we began to repress those things and, 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 and divide up sides. And do you know that there's really only two sides in our world, in our universe, in our spiritual realm? There's good and evil. And people, a lot of people are saying, well, no, no, there's more sides and there's hundreds of sides. No, there isn't. And everything I can read in here tells me that there's only two sides. And I can pick and choose which side I'm on. And I get to be that benefactor of how I stand. Habakkuk was kind of an interesting guy. He, he had these perplexing times and, 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 and there'd been these troubles and these heavy burdens and there'd been this fighting and Assyria and Babylon were, were trying to conquer the lands and did conquer the lands that, that were around him. And you had all this hardship and, and, and catastrophe. The world was literally turned upside down for those in that region. It, it's, it's much like when you think about it, you ever, you ever get just a chance encounter that kind of shapes your day, your week, maybe even your month? There's a lady who was traveling from New York to Los Angeles, and she happened to get a seat next to a lawyer. And the lawyer was very talkative, and he wanted to spend time talking, and the lady just wanted to sleep. She didn't want anything to do with him, not, not because he was a lawyer, but just because she wanted to sleep. And so she's trying to sleep, and he says, hey, why don't we play this game? We've got a long uh, ride here. Why don't we just play this game? I'll ask you a question. If you can answer it, I'll pay you $5. And if you ask me a question and I can answer it, you pay me $5. She said, no, I don't want to play. He said, well, what about $50 if you get the answer right? You pay me $5 if I get it right, not fifty. <laughs> no. Got her, I got up to $500. She said, okay, if it'll make you be quiet, I'll play. He said, what is the distance from the earth to the moon? Didn't even hesitate. Reaches in her purse, gives him five bucks. He said, okay, your turn. It's okay. What is it that goes up the hill with three legs, turns around in 10 minutes, walks back down the hill and has four legs? He said, well, I don't know. Let me think about this. So he gets his phone out. He's beginning to search his phone. And Google can't help him out. He gets online and on the, on the plane, he signs into the internet he, he searches the Library of Congress, can't come up with an answer he's been wrestling with. About an hour later, he wakes her up and says, I don't know, here's your $500. And he said, what's the answer? She immediately reaches in her purse and gives him five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> See, sometimes we get the idea that, that by my cunning, by my intellect, by my, uh, uh, I'm enlightened, I'm I'm. I'm educated to some degree. I, I've got, I'm smart. I can, I can handle this. And sometimes we don't even understand all the questions. See, I think we're asking the wrong question about our day and time today. Many of us are asking what's going to happen and how can we protect this and how can we fight against that? And I want to tell you that Habakkuk had the right idea. He had the right approach for today. Verse 1, chapter 1 of the book of Habakkuk. And just as a side note, this may scare you off, it may not scare you off, but over the next several weeks, we're going to go through the whole book of Habakkuk. It starts with a kind of an outline of, of trouble and distress, and, and it's one of those books that I love because you ever wanted to ask God a question? Oh, come on, be honest. We all wanted to ask God questions. Why did this happen? Why didn't that happen? Why is it? He gets to ask questions. God answers. He asks another question. God answers. They, and it goes from this time of where where Habakkuk is burdened and distressed to this time of praise and loving on his Lord and Savior. And that's really all we want. That's what I want. I want some answers that God would help me get closer to him. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 1 says this. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw. You know, it's so funny. We can go through life and we can see a multitude of things. Or we cannot see a multitude of things. I talked to somebody once who was a who was a carpenter, and he said it's hard for him because everything he sees is something damaged that he needs to repair. Talk to a doctor, and you know it seems like to them everybody bombards them with medical questions. Everything is a medical issue, and the way they address things most of the times is looking at it through the lens of a doctor, or the lens of a carpenter, or the you know, we kind of do that. We get used to looking at things from a certain perspective. The reality is sometimes God calls us to look at a burden in a new and a fresh way. 
Do you notice there that it says the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw? It doesn't say, and, and everybody look at me, you may want to even write this down. It doesn't say the burden that Habakkuk took on. Let that sink in a minute. Do you know that every burden in this world is not yours to carry? Some of them are tough. Some of them are hard. And some of them are yours specifically. But some of them aren't. So we've got this, this bemoaning, if you will, and the prophets looking at this struggle and looking at this hardship. And God displays His power and promise as He takes the prophet Habakkuk from this, from this terrible spot, this difficult spot, to a greater glory. Now, let me ask you this. If he, if he were to do that to you and help you to see the burden, help you to respond to the burden, help you to get through the burden, maybe even help someone else with a burden, wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be awesome? You know, it would, it would be this weird phenomenon instead of being on the hamster wheel of life. You know what? I, I call it the hamster wheel. It's where everything is like Groundhog Day. Everything happens over and over and over and over and over again. And every day... Every day you go through those same things, those same struggles and those same situations. And if you played the news over and over, it'd be the same news. They plug in different stuff. I heard stuff yesterday that was the exact same thing I heard two months ago. Panic, fear, and anxiety. Let's stir the pot. God says, and, and, the, and the prophet's question is really, really pointed. See it there in verse 2? Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear, even crying out to you violence and you will not save? See, if I were honest with you and hopefully you were honest with me, I think we would ask that same question. Lord, how long is this chaos going to go on? How long, how, long is this, how long is this supposed to take place? See, here's a word that I don't want to ever hear again. People say they have a word, and this is the new norm. No, it's not. And it's not going to be. See, see, we're so funny, us as human beings. We think we got a handle on stuff. And we can understand what the new norm is. We don't even understand the old happenings. More or less the new norm. Are we going to endure these things? And the, and the prophet's quandary, Lord, it, you begin to see it there in verse 3. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contentions arise. Does that not describe 2020? But the prophet's quandary is, he, he wants to know how long, but he also wants to know how come, Lord? How come are we going through this? How, how come are we going through this? I have the simple answer and then I have the long answer. Isn't it nice to have answers? Well, sometimes. The simple answer is God uses all things for His betterment, for the improvement of those who are called to His purpose, for those who are willing to surrender and follow Him. He will make something good of this. Now, don't misquote me and say, you know, Wayne said this is good stuff. This is beneficial to us. That's not what I said. What I said was God's going to make something good of it. And somehow out of this tragedy, somehow out of this confusion, somehow out of this selfishness of our world, God's going to come out and be glorified. And because God is glorified, it's going to be better for me, better for you, and better for our world. So how come, Lord? And then, and then the... Oh, Lord, verse 2, Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear. Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not say. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contentions arise. Therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Their perverse judgments proceed. Can you write a better and clearer depict, depiction of 2020? I can't. It seems that on the, on the one side, those who want to promote and prevail and, and honestly tear down not only our world, but us as individuals, they're winning.
And Habakkuk here. He sees it. He sees it as when trouble happens, you run to God. But you know what's weird? And we got to give him a little slack. We got to get on him a little too, though, because he didn't have the internet like us. He couldn't go to Google and get help. He couldn't listen to the nightly news and let them inform him of what he's supposed to think. And if God forbid some kind of debate happened between politicians. He didn't have somebody to give commentary on commentary's commentary. <laughs> Habakkuk knew that when things got difficult, when, when he got confused, when he got hurt, when he got overwhelmed, he knew that the one step that was necessary was take a step toward God. Well, you ask me, well, what does that look like, Wayne? I don't know. For each of us, I think it's a little bit different. Some of us are going to take a more bold stand. Some of us are going to take a more private stand. But believe it or not, everybody must take a stand. We should not. We should not cower down to the burden. We should not cower down to the destruction. See, there's a right and a, and a reason for this bemoaning. Habakkuk could walk through difficult times, no doubt. But you know, so, so has our world. So have we. But you need to take heart this morning. This, this, this world is not over. God is not at the end of his ropes with us. I don't believe that. I believe he's got great plans for his children, his remnant, and he's going to take care of them. And, and not only take care of you, which sometimes gives the idea that we're going to sneak through, I think he's going to bless. I think he's going to bless in a big way. So we have this bemoaning, and then we have the bewildering. Verse 5. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days, which you would not believe, though it were told you. Now, i got to be honest. I'm right there with Habakkuk. I know what he's talking about there, and I know he's talking about his, his particular place and those particular people, but, but it seems like we are on the verge of a of a preface where it will take God's mighty hand to fix this. And the clarification has to come from God, not from some outward source. And, and please don't take this the wrong way, but I got to throw it out here. The clarification also doesn't need to come from us. I need to surrender to God and to God's will. You ever wonder why God himself, Jesus Christ on the cross would say, not my will, but your will, Father? Because you know when push comes to shove in the heat of the moment, when things are catastrophic, what do we do? We resort to self-preservation. Rightfully so. <laughs> Rightfully so. But God's got big plans. I know this is going to sound really weird, and I never could have envisioned. Maybe you, maybe you saw some of this coming, 2020 stuff. I, 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 it, it passed anything that I could have ever envisioned months ago, honestly. Um, had no clue. But in the process of this, I sometimes forget that God has seen this movie. You're like, now wait a minute. You know he's omniscient, right? You know he's omnipotent. Those are funny words for like he knows everything. He knows stuff. He knows the end stuff. And if he knows the end stuff, help me here. If he knows the end stuff, doesn't he know the in-between stuff? Where are we? We're in between. He knows the in-between stuff. He knows all the stuff that's happening in the world. He knows that stuff we haven't even read on, on Yahoo News yet. He knows that stuff. You, you know that private stuff, that stuff you keep locked inside that you don't even share with anybody else? He knows that stuff too. And he's got a plan for it. Shouldn't he, it be, shouldn't we at some point get to the point where we say, you know what, God, this really is bigger than me. But that's okay. Tell me what to do, Lord. And you know what he'll do? If, if he believes, if he trusts in you 
and ask you to take three steps, he'll provide a way for you to take those three steps. So Habakkuk's here and he's, he's getting things straight, but he's, he's bewildered and the clarification comes. And then there's a caution, verse uh, six. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not there. themselves their horses are also are also are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves their charges charge ahead the, their cavalry comes from afar they fly as the eagle that hastens to eat now i don't know about you but if you're giving a rah-rah speech a go get them speech that's not it because you know what they're thinking they're thinking what any of us would be uh-uh no, uh -uh. they're way above us. It doesn't, it doesn't strike us the same, but the Chaldeans were those who marched through and conquered places. They didn't come in and set up a shop and say, hey, you can, you can reside with me. They just killed people, lots of people, droves of people. And, and here Habakkuk's telling them, God said that they are mightier, they are stronger, they are more capable, they are more agile. He just went down the list. I think he could have stopped after verse six. I think the point was made. He's cautioning them and, and putting them, I think, in a place of respect. Respect for the adversary and respect for the victor. Now, here's the problem. I think we have lost the respect for our adversary. We've got caught up in all these tid, tidbits and, and tiffs and, and fights and jarring of words and we have forgotten that our adversary seeks to kill and destroy and will be satisfied with nothing less than killing and destroying. We got the idea that you can you can placate, you can advocate for, you you can even accommodate. Accommodation only goes as far as God calls it to go. At some point there will be a breaking of walking together, lest two be agreed. God's saying very clearly that there is this caution. And then there's this Really interesting response. Verse 9. They all come for violence. They're they deride every stronghold for they heal. Power to his God. Just to make certain that we understand, Habakkuk draws the, the line between those who are on the good side and the evil side. Those who are with God, the God, and a God, some other God. He makes sure that we understand that there's a distinction between the two and that in difficult times and overwhelming times, there's got to be this, this looking for God's divine involvement. And if we're looking for God's divine involvement, what does it look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. If you have that little bulletin that you have before you, or if not, you have a little piece of paper, you may want to jot these down. I jotted down just 10 of them right off the top of my head. See, the providence of God, God's divine providence, His wise and personal acts, first of all, start with His patience. I got to be honest with you. If, if I were God, which that would be the world's greatest stretch, I couldn't be that patient. I couldn't be that calm, but... But God is calm. And, and in his patience is wrath. And grace. And he deals with them in such a way that he reflects. I, I, can't, I can't get this one around my little head, but he looks at them and says. like a brat they are acting like a brat but do you know acting like a brat doesn't get you kicked out of the family of God you still with me his consistency rely on his patience knowing full well that he has a plan and a process don't panic 
The second thing is his perspective. Do you know that God's perspective is unnatural? Just completely unnatural. The natural thing is for us to, to, to build walls. And even those who take over cities and create autonomous zones suddenly build walls and set up guards. Because that's what we do to protect ourselves. But do you know that God is fighting your battle even while you're asleep? He doesn't need you to set up a wall. He needs you to walk with him. Understand and rely on him. He needs you to let his unnatural, continual, spiritual realm unfold. Because we, we don't fight against flesh and blood. We wrestle against principalities and powers in high places. We get so caught up in fighting the flesh around us that we don't realize that God is trying to fight the spiritual around us. Number three. We have his patience, his perspective, his purpose. His pers purpose is different too. We want, I want, maybe maybe you don't, I don't know. A lot of us, we, a lot of us just want to get along. <laughs> we want things smooth. We want things, I, can I use this word? We want things normal, whatever normal used to be. Whatever my perspective of normal used to be. But God looks at it and has a purpose. And sometimes his purpose for things happening in the world is a sifting. A sifting of those who are not standing with him. A sifting of those who have decided to walk some other direction. A, a sifting of those who are wolves in sheep's clothing. Now you say, well, families. And if we are not careful, they are us. But it's not just for sifting, it's for strengthening. To enter into eternity. I think our world today, if you were to put it up against those worlds that were um, well bad people are like well you, you, you read about Sodom and Gomorrah you read about the Roman Empire and the debauchery there I gotta tell you our world's just right there with them it's just right there with them we can't explain away the things that are going on we just gotta say you know right God you're right we're as bad as bad can be and and one of the divine acts of God, his providence is to push the pause button. Because you know what he could do? But he's patient and long-suffering that none should perish, but all kinds of repentance and know him. I'm going to say this, and I don't know how to say what can do with it. Um, I'm glad that God is God. That to vote on everything is right. To have a majority is us in this world we, we have made a and say no and praying about things and God said I already said it cost me and it's a hardship and people are going to attack me I hung with those sins. I carried them.
God's purity is different. And we need to stand with him no matter what. His wise and personal acts also include his pardon. Undeserved and so, so appreciated. I'm so glad that God has pardoned me. Because I get to kick around one more day. And if God should come and, and send his son to get his children, I get to make the trip. Not because of anything I've done, but only because I've confessed him and, and he has felt mercy on me. Number seven, his promise. His promise to never leave nor forsake you. I, I want to emphasize this. He is here. We're like, I know he is, Wayne. I feel it when I walk in the sanctuary. I know that God's here. No, no, no. He's here in our world. He hasn't vacated the premises. He isn't gone. He's here. He's alive and well and working. Number eight, his preciousness. Never, never, a, never a more clear picture of what God is and what God isn't than today. You can see how precious God is. He's so much of a distinction to what is normal in our world. And every day that I see a... a that I have, I, I can see a clearer and clearer distinction of who God is and what our world is. You know, you never want to say, I told you so, but uh, God told you so. Told us so. He, he told us this time we come. God said it's going to come. It's, you know, it's going to come. <laughs> now, I must admit, I'd like to know how long is it going to stay? I get it, Lord. You said it's coming. When's it going? I get it. He, he gave us advance notice that we might get prepared for this day. And you know what we did? We goofed off. You know, I never understood more the, the scripture in the Bible when it says that, that the Son of Man will return as a thief in the night and no one will be watching. I always wonder, well, how would, why wouldn't we be watching? We're a, we're a godly nation. we got churches on every corner. We sometimes got two on a corner. They're everywhere. Well, if you're distracted by the world and the things that the world's throwing at you, if you're distracted by the way the devil's attacking, if you're, it, you're distracted by all the stuff that's happening in 2020, it's pretty easy to get caught off guard and not realize that God is just around the corner. He predicted that this would happen and he predicted that he would return. Both of them valid. Last thing. His preconditioning. He has walked through this time in his mind and in his heart. He has walked through this time and the events and, the, and, and all the circumstances with it that we might walk in such a way that we would have his strength to walk through this time. Do you feel strong? Don't you feel excited about 2020? Most people I talk to say, I'm good. I'm, I'm just, I'm afraid to open the door on July. Not even talking about 2021. Do you realize, do you, do you realize it's been 20 years since Y2K? Everybody thought everything was going to crash. Everything going to go away. Nothing will be right. All the banks are going to shut down. You're not going to have any money. I won't even get into all the things that they thought. God is preparing us for what's going on now. But please hear this. He's also preparing us for what's coming. We are not out of the woods yet. We are not out of the woods yet. And God has provision for us that we might walk with him. Every once in a while, things happen in such a way, though, that we are, we are shocked by what happens. You know, if you ever say something and you have a good idea of what you're saying and then someone else receives that a complete different way? That doesn't happen to you? Well, it happens to me a lot. Mostly because my little mind can't slow down. And it just doesn't slow down. Anyway, um, my wife and I were talking yesterday. Karen and I were talking yesterday. And uh, 
I don't normally do this, but it was pretty funny. And I wish, oh, I so wish that I would have had a phone or a camera or something to take a picture of her face. Um, we were talking about, I haven't been feeling well for several months. And um, I, I have this um, running streak. And I, I think today was 94 days in a row that I've run. And some of those days have been very difficult. I haven't had the strength or energy. Anyways, just a lot going on. Anyways, so I was going to go run yesterday, and she said something about why. And she was a little frustrated because I was going to go run when I don't feel good. And, and so I said, do you know that I, on Facebook, there's a group that I belong to of streakers? <laughs> yeah, that's the look. <laughs> and she's like, what? <laughs> and I said, no, it, wait, no, it's a... Uh, like a streak, a number of days in a row that you run. <laughs> Are we on the same page now? <laughs> the way you said that just makes it sound like a lame excuse. <laughs> That's her. Y'all's faces look very similar to hers. She was really concerned, but in in the process of things, I had made a determination that I wanted to run every day. Now that may seem kind of strange to you. It may seem uh, trivial. But at some point, there's a decision-making process where you say, I don't feel good, or this hurts, or this is getting in the way, or what do I do? How do I make this happen? Were you wondering yet? I think the first thing that Habakkuk's telling us is to be a people of streets. Not, not like throw off your clothes and go run. <laughs> but maybe your streak today needs to be, needs to be I'm going to read God's Word every day. Every day, no matter what. And don't put a limit on it. I'm going to read for 30 minutes or an hour. Don't do all that stuff. Just, I'm going to read God's Word every day. Maybe, and for most of us, and this will sound strange, do you know that most people don't pray? We talk about prayer. We say a lot about it. But most people don't pray. Maybe the streak is that you will talk to God every day. For a lot of people, we go to church on Sunday, we sit in this place, we look at His Word, we, we pour ourselves out to Him, and He pours ourselves in, and then we shut it down, and next week we come back together and do it again. Maybe the streak needs to be that I will, I will think about God and pray to Him. I will talk with Him. Maybe it me, needs to be I'll meditate on His Word. Maybe it needs to be, you know, God, once a week, every week, for as long as you tell me, I'm going to do something nice to someone. I'm going to be your hands and your feet to someone. I'm going to start a streak, Lord, with you. What would that look like? What difference would that make? Not only, not only in your world, but to you. Because I think it'd make a big difference. A big difference. And you know the best part is? You get to be, begin with God by saying, God, what do you want me to do? Clean slate. I'm yours. And, and just as a byproduct, do you know that you don't have to have everything perfect in your life to have a streak with God? To walk with God? He'll fix all those other things. Get, don't, don't even worry about it. Don't even worry about it. Don't stress yourself about it. You know why, why I do the running streak thing? It's because every day I know that at some point in that day I'm going to run. It's already decided. It's settled. There isn't any discussion. There isn't any debate. The only debate will be is whether I have to do it at, at 1130 at night because I didn't get it in. Or I can do it at 4 in the morning because i got to get a busy day. It's already settled. You know the problem with us, the problem with Habakkuk, the problem with our world this day is we haven't settled a few things. Just settle it. I'm not going to track you down. I'm not going to say, how's it going? Well, I might if you want to share it with me. Tell me what your streak is. I'll pray for you that God gives you wisdom and strength and how to fulfill it. I think it would be awesome. And I think you'll be surprised how God will bless you. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this time. I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you that we get the chance to even dream about a streak of walking with you that we can take comfort. In the midst of the chaos and the destruction, we can find peace and harmony with you. Oh, Lord, show us, each individually, how we can make a stand for you and be a blessing with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.